This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there, HRT, in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Mysterious Circumstances is an American Crimecast production. Remember, everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Hey everybody, it's Justin, back with a Mysterious Circumstances podcast. This is uh, going to be another short episode. Still doing a little bit of research into my uh, my next full-length episode. Uh, getting a lot of contradictory stories from witnesses and police uh, that I'm investigating, so it's taking a little bit more time than I really hoped for. Uh, I should have that podcast cast out either later tonight or tomorrow. But until then, I have noticed that I've had a lot of downloads from California, so I wanted to dedicate my uh, short episode to everybody out there on the West Coast. I actually used to live in uh, Oceanside for a little bit of a time and kind of miss it around this time of year. Definitely miss the uh, ocean air, that's that's for sure. Um, But this short episode is going to be called 10 Bizarre uh, Mysteries from California. And it's a list that was submitted to Listverse uh, by Tristan Shaw. And I was reading through them. A lot of these are pretty interesting, so I'm sure you guys will, I'm sure you guys out there on the West Coast will like this. And uh, let's see here. All right. Although California is known for awesome things like Hollywood and Silicon Valley, it definitely has a dark side too. And for decades, its alternative freewheeling atmospheres attracted weird cults like the uh, Manson Family and Heaven's Gate. It has also given the U.S. more serial killers than any other state except for Texas. Some of California's unsolved mysteries, like those involving the Black Dahlia and the Zodiac Killer, are known across the country, but plenty of California mysteries, equally bizarre and horrific, have slipped past the rest of the U.S. over the years. All right, this list is going to start off with number 10, the murder of James Gilmore Jr. James Gilmore Jr., whose nickname was Jimmy, was a pretty tough 14-year-old boy from Baldwin Park. Who uh, He was a bully. Uh, he ran around with a teenage motorcycle gang, actually. And his parents were separated, and the family was well-known by the local police. Uh, the neighbors considered Jimmy a nuisance, and even even his own mother and siblings didn't really even like him that much. And that says a lot right there. If your own family don't even like you, you know, that's that's pretty bad. But while uh, he was home alone on a, on night of January 7th, 1962, uh, Jimmy and his younger brother Wayne heard a knock on the back door. Well, apparently he wasn't alone. Uh, while they were watching TV, 
Uh, they heard this knock, and Jimmy told Wayne that he was going outside and would be back in a little while. So when Jimmy had returned, Jimmy hadn't returned after three days his mother reported him missing to the police. She told him that her son was vicious and had probably run off with some friends. Although Jimmy's father expressed skepticism about the story, suggesting that his son might not have left the house at all, authorities never really considered the family to be involved in Jimmy's disappearance. So in March 1985, more than a decade after the Gilmores moved out of the house where Jimmy had lived, a worker helping to renovate the home found Jimmy's skeleton buried beneath the building in a shallow grave. Even though Jimmy's remains had, had been lying under the house for more than two decades, neither the Gilmores nor the man who lived in the house after them had ever reported smelling anything. The police gave a lie detector test to Jimmy's brother and parents, but all three family members passed. And as of late 2015, no one has been arrested for Jimmy's murder, and most of the people connected to the place are no longer alive. Now, if you guys do know anything about lie detector tests, they're pretty circumstantial, and I'm pretty sure they're even, you know, they don't even hold up in court. Uh, if you can control your breathing, your stress levels, and your heart rate, you can usually lie your way out of a lie detector test pretty, pretty good uh, from some of the research I've done. Uh, number nine on the list is the death of Michelle Von Emster. And in April 15, 1994, the lifeless body of a nude woman was found floating in the water off a beach at San Diego's Point Loma community. The woman was horrifically mutilated. Her right leg had been torn off and other pieces of flesh were either missing or covered in bite marks and bruises. Although nobody could locate her closer ID, a butterfly tattoo on her shoulder uh, eventually led authorities to identify the Jane Doe as Michelle Von Emster, a 25-year-old drifter who lived in the area. Now, according to Brian Blackburn, the San Diego medical examiner who conducted the aut autopsy, Emster was alive when she was savagely attacked. Her neck had been broken and some of her ribs were cracked too. Given the severity of her injuries, Blackburn concluded that Emster was attacked by a great white shark and then died from massive blood loss and drowning. Uh, the bite marks on her body, which were too small to have been caused by a great shark, probably came from uh, blue sharks after she had died. Blackburn ruled that Emster's death, death was nothing more than a tragic accident. On the other hand, many shark experts dismissed Blackburn's conclusion. Contrary to what we see in Jaws, shark attacks are rare, especially in the waters where Emster's body was found. Blackburn confessed that he knew nothing about sharks. He consulted a marine biologist who later acknowledged that there was no direct evidence of a great white being involved. Even, even if Emster had been attacked by a great white, skeptics point out that it could have occurred after her death. After all, a number of strange details about the case are still unanswered, including why, for example, have her clothes never been found? Her roommate, who had dropped her off at the beach the night before her body was discovered, said that Emster was wearing a green trench coat. The temperature that night was only 15 degrees Celsius, which is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So why would she have been swimming naked in any way? You know, there's no real reason for that. And how did she get sand in her lungs? So over the years, a number of theories have been advanced from suicide to murder. Yet Emster's death still remains a hotly debated mystery. See, we got number eight on the list here is... The Disappearance of Anna Waters And on January 16th, 1973 uh, Michael Benedict was chatting uh, inside with some friends Or Michelle Benedict, my fault Was chatting inside with some friends While her four-year-old daughter, Anna Waters Was playing in the backyard at their home in San Mateo County at about 2.20 p.m., after not hearing Anna for quite some time, Michelle re realized that her little girl wasn't in the backyard anymore. So after searching her property for about a half an hour, uh, Michelle called the police, and initially the investigators feared that Anna had fallen into a nearby creek and drowned, but no trace of her was ever found in or near the water. Now, although the accusation 
has never been proven, some investigators and family members believe that Anna's biological father, George Henry Waters, may have abducted her. Waters was a prestigious doctor who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. His friends, his friendship with a shady psychic named George Brody uh, destroyed his marriage with Anna's mother, and he eventually went off to live with Brody in San Francisco after, after their divorce. So Brody, who was a mysterious and manipulative con man, insisted that Anna was the reincarnation of a woman he had once known. Strangely, Waters never showed any concern over Brody's obsession with his daughter. So when Brody died in 1981, Waters committed suicide two weeks later. Years after Anna went missing, her half-brother Nanda remembered an incident that he and Anna had never told their parents about. A month before her disappearance, Anna and Nanda had been playing in front of their home when an unfamiliar man and woman pulled up to them in a Chevy Impala. The couple tried persuading Anna to get into their car but left after she refused. Whether this couple had anything to do with Anna's later disappearance has never really been established. Uh, number seven on the list is the murder of Georgette Bauerdorf. Now, shortly after noon on October 12, 1944, 20-year-old Georgette Bauerdorf, Bauerdorf was found dead in her apartment in West Hollywood. Bauerdorf, an aspiring actress and the daughter of a wealthy oil tycoon, was discovered face down in the bathtub with a washcloth stuffed in her mouth. At first, police thought that uh, Bauerdorf might have drowned after slipping and becoming unconscious, but the autopsy concluded that she had been beaten, raped, and suffocated. Um, although all of her valuable jewelry had been left untouched, the killer did steal $100 in a car from Georgette. The car was found about 12 miles away, which is about 20 kilometers from her apartment the next day. Uh, police also discovered that a light outside her apartment had been unscrewed and turned off. Her front door was unlocked, which suggests that the killer either had a key or forced his way in after luring her uh, to open up the door. Now, Georgette was a hostess at a Hollywood club that entertained servicemen, so police speculated that the killer might have been somebody she knew there. A co-worker told them that she had a strange ex-boyfriend whom she had gone out with the previous month. The man was a serviceman who dearly loved her, but she didn't have the same feelings and broke up with him. The authorities tried in vain to find the man, but he was obviously never located. A uh, year after Georgette's death, the, the L.A. police received a bizarre note claiming that her killer was a soldier who served in Okinawa. Uh, the murder of Georgette was divine retribution, it said. Uh, let the Los Angeles police arrest the murderer if they can. That's a pretty good note. And obviously, the uh, Los Angeles police did not arrest the murderer. And... Uh, yeah, and my next podcast about Bobby Fuller, yeah, we'll be definitely talking about the LAPD and how they uh, have a have a pretty good knack for botching some serious investigations. But anyway, number six on the list is the di disappearance of Bryce Les Pisa. Uh, in the early hours of August 30th, 2013, 19-year-old college student uh, Bryce was driving home from Northern California when he called his parents and told them he was going to pull over and sleep. Uh, Bryce had been visiting his girlfriend, and he never returned home that morning. So around 8 a.m., an officer from California Highway Patrol showed up at his parents' house in Laguna, uh, Niguel, to tell them that Bryce's crashed car had been found near Castiac Lake. The car had been discovered lying on its side and its back windshield cracked open. There was no sign of Bryce, although his wallet, phone, and laptop had been left behind. While he might have been able to get out of the car, authorities speculated that he could have suffered a head injury in the crash. And despite numerous uh, searches of the area, both air and foot, 
Bryce has never been found. Rather than being the unfortunate victim of foul play, Bryce's parents believe that their son is still alive. Now, a few days before his disappearance, Bryce hadn't been acting like himself. He had broken up with his girlfriend on August 28th, and his parents reported him missing the next day after he failed to give them a promised phone call. After police found Bryce unharmed at a rest stop, he called his family and said that he was fine. Now, as for the crash uh, near the lake, some people have theorized that Bryce ran away from home, and several unconfirmed sightings have placed him in Washington, Nevada, and Oregon, but all those are pretty much still unconfirmed, and he is still missing today. Uh, number five on the list, we have the disappearance of Christine Walters. On November 12, 2008, a couple near the Northern, Cal Northern California city of Eureka found 23-year-old Christine Waters naked and bleeding on their doorstep. They took the incomprehensible young woman to a hospital where she refused to explain what had happened to her. After she was discharged, Walters told her mother in Wisconsin that she had been chased by demons through the forest after she participated in a shaman, shamanic ritual. Uh, which, if anybody understands the study of uh, shamanism, shamanism actually is uh, putting yourself in a trance state to either let uh, the other world communicate through you or to actually communicate with the other world a lot of other stuff does go into shamanism but that is definitely a uh, pretty big part of it um her mom after after christine told her mom that her mom offered to fly to california to get her but walters insisted that she would fly back to wisconsin by herself now according to her mother walters acted paranoid on the phone over the next few days she believed that the forest demons were trying to hunt her down. She couldn't say why she was bleeding and naked that day because the demons wouldn't would hear her. So on November 14th, Walters left her ID and backpack at a coffee shop and walked out and she was never seen again. Walters had been staying on the west coast for about four months preceding her disappearance. So... She had fallen in love, actually, with uh, Northern California's natural beauty, which definitely understandable. And, uh, you know, she fell in love with the alternative lifestyle scene as well. So, and according to friends and family back home, she had met a, met a group of like-minded spiritualists. And Walter was a trusting, Walters was a trusting person, and it's, and it's possible she might have become involved with a dangerous crowd uh, of the alternative community. Uh, number four on the list here is the murder of Stephanie Crow. Uh, the morning of January 21st, 1998, 12-year-old Stephanie Crow was discovered dead in her bedroom by her grandmother in Escondido. She was found lying in her doorway, but had been stabbed in her bed nine times. Police were unable to find fingerprints or DNA at the scene of the murder. And they never found the murder weapon either. Uh, amazingly, none of Stephanie's family members claimed to have heard or seen anything suspicious during the night. Nothing in her bedroom was in disarray, and her door showed no signs of forced entry. Now, a schi schizophrenic drifter named Richard Tuitt had, had been seen in the Crow's neighborhood the previous night, banging on doors and shouting for a girl they call he called Tracy. However, the authorities let him go due to lack of evidence. Uh, their investigation then turned to Stephanie's older brother, Michael. He said that he had walked past Stephanie's bedroom in the early morning yet hadn't seen her body in the doorway. So, the police actually accused Michael of being jealous of Stephanie, and he eventually confessed to his sister's murder after a series of brutal and manipulative interrogations. Uh, his friends, Josh Treadway and Aaron Hauser, were also implicated and questioned. Uh, although Josh did admit his role in the murder, Aaron denied have, having anything to do with it. And he offered a deta detailed hypothesis of how the murder might have been carried out, yet he never gave a confession. 
The three teenagers were initially charged with murder, but never prosecuted because their confessions were forced. Uh, suspicions turned again to Richard Tewitt, whose shirt was found to have traces of Stephanie's blood. Now, Tewitt's lawyer argued that her that her client's shirt, which had been taken by the police when they arrested him, had been contaminated due to sloppy handling of crime scene evidence. Uh, although Tewitt was convinced convicted for Stephanie's murder in 2005, he was acquitted after a retrial in 2013, again, due to lack of evidence. Uh, Alright, number three on the list. This one is actually a, a more well-known unsolved mystery. Uh, you can actually find a lot of other podcasts that uh, actually did do the research and, and go over this one. Uh, it is the Ketty Murders. Uh, so, Ketty is a quiet and peaceful resort town of log cabins, uh, which is which happened to be the site of a horrific quadruple homicide in 1981. On the night of April 11th, 14-year-old Sheila Sharp had gone to a neighbor's house to spend the night. When she came home in the morning, she found that her mother, Sue, her brother, Johnny, and his friend, Dana, had all been tied up and stabbed to death. Her younger sister, Tina, was missing, yet her younger brothers, Ricky and Greg, and their friend, Justin, were unharmed in the brother's bedroom. The police were at a loss to uncover the killer or a motive. The murder victims had been relentlessly tortured. Uh, Sue and Johnny had been struck with a hammer and Dana had been strangled. The stabbing was so vi- had, had been so violent that the blade of the murder weapon, which was a steak knife, was actually bent backwards. Uh, incredibly, Ricky and Greg said that they had slept through the attack, but Justin changed his so- story several times. And in one of his accounts... He said that he witnessed the murders and Tina being taken. And in other statements, statements, he uh, he claimed to have dreamed the incidents he described. Uh, In 1984, Tina's skull was found about 30 miles away from Ketty. And her cause of death could not be determined. But it seemed that she had died the night of the attack. Uh, Meanwhile, the search for the murderer was pretty much at a standstill. There were still no suspects, although Justin's father, Martin Smart, and his friend, uh, his friend Bo, acted strangely when they were interviewed by police. Smart even described how the murders might have been carried out, yet he was never pressed any further. Uh, years after the murders, his therapist claimed that Smart once said that he had killed Sue because she encouraged his wife to, to divorce him. Uh, he supposedly killed Tina too, but denied killing Johnny and Dana. So both Smart and Bo are long dead, but however, this case still remains officially unsolved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Still fighting that cold off a little bit. But anyway, uh, number two we got here. Uh, the unsolved San Diego murders of 1931 through 1934. So, between the years of 1931 and 34, a series of brutal unsolved murders were committed in San Diego. While the murders were never clearly linked together, police believe that there is a connection because all five victims were young females. The first victim, Virginia Brooks, disappeared on her way to school in February of 1931. And her body was found later in a burlap sack. Uh, it was roughly about a month later. And she was... One of the newspaper reporters uh, stated that she was virtually hacked to pieces. Uh, the second victim, a 20-year-old woman named uh, Louise Tuber, was found hanging nude from a tree on April 19th in 1931. Uh, her coat dress and underwear were discovered uh, near her body along with a package that held her bra Uh, first police thought that it might have been a suicide but her left hip neck and shoulders were also showed bruises the autopsy later concluded that she had been strangled by the rope and then suspended from it 
Uh, less than a week after her murder, a woman named Dolly Bibbins was found dead in her apartment. She had also been strangled to death. So on May 4th, 1931, 27 year old Hazel Bradshaw was found stabbed to, de to death in Balboa Park. Uh, an old sweetheart, uh, Moss Garrison, was charged with the murder, but he was later acquitted. And for the next three years, the murderer is believed to have been quiet until he struck again on October 17, 1934. Uh, his fifth and final victim, 16-year-old uh, Celia Coda, had left her house around 8 p.m. to go for a walk. Her parents reported her missing around midnight, and her body was found by police in the family's backyard in the morning. Now, granted, Coda might not have been the San Diego killer's last victim, but there's also the possibility that the murders were never connected. Uh, number one on the list. Uh, this one should be actually pretty interesting right here. Uh, the death of Gary DeVore. Gary DeVore this, the, uh, was a screenwriter uh, behind Hollywood movies Raw Deal and Time Cop. He was working uh, on a remake of a 1949 movie called The Big Steel before he disappeared on June 28, 1997. Uh, after visiting a, a friend in New Mexico for a week, Devorah left to go home to Santa Barbara, California on June 27th. So around 12.38 a.m., Devorah called his wife, Wendy, on the cell phone, uh, but she... She said she'd call back after a TV show she was watching ended around 1 a.m. When the show was over, Wendy called her husband three times, yet he didn't pick up. At 1.15 a.m., DeVore called her back, saying he would be home in the next couple of hours. That was the last time anybody has ever heard from him. A year after DeVore's disappearance, a lawyer and armchair detective named Douglas Crawford read about the case in a newspaper and suddenly remembered a story about a woman who had driven into the California aqueduct. Crawford suspected that the same thing might have happened to DeVore. So in early July, Crawford retracted DeVore's, er, retraced DeVore's route and found car debris on the aqueduct's embankment. He contacted the police and a search of the water discovered DeVore's car where his body was found in the front seat. A number of different theories have been proposed about uh, how, to, how, how he ended up in the aqueduct. Some suggest that he committed suicide, while others thought he had driven into it accidentally. Uh, his wife believes that he was abducted and murdered, and during his last phone call to her, DeVore had not acted uh, like his usual self. Uh, Wendy suspects that somebody was with him. So, a conspiracy theory which was the subject of a 2014 documentary called The Writer With No Hands, claims that he was murdered by the CIA. Now, according to this theory, DeVore had been involved with the CIA and was assassina assassinated after he planned to incorporate some dark secrets about the 1989 U.S. invasion of Panama into his new script. Now... How anybody would know he would be involved with the CIA, let alone know that he was going to incorporate this into a new script, is beyond me. But those are uh, your 10 creepy facts about California. Just for the California listeners out there. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, look forward to doing my next podcast, which should be some here within the next 24 hours. Uh, I'll see you guys later, and imagine I'll see you on the flip side. visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi said, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. 
Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer radio show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth.